Hi, this is Jason with Green Star Productions. I'd like to thank you for tuning into this video where I'll be embedding a toy Night Fury in a resin block. If you're new to the channel, thanks for tuning in. If you're a returning guest, well, welcome back. All right, now as you see on the screen before you, you see the little Night Fury toy and then the block, not the block, the slice of uh, maple that I'm going to be using as the base the toy and then I'm going to embed it in resin. This is just a simple piece of maple that I uh, sliced off of a limb I took off a tree in my yard when I was trimming trees last year. I thought it kind of fit the ethos. I was, uh, if you remember from the movie, there's a, a visual dictionary of all the dragon species that's you know, simple line drawings on uh, sepia-toned parchment and with the descriptions of the dragons and their names all given in Norse runes. So I decided to do this sculpture with a bit of the same flair but make it almost three-dimensional. Now what you see me doing here is I'm taking some of the bark off of the side of the uh, wood slice just that I have a nice flat surface for uh, writing the name. And I'm just, you know, as you can see, I'm just putting in a vise and using a, uh, using my sander to just take the, uh, take that bark right off. I'm not looking for, uh, I wasn't looking for anything perfect. Again, the idea is to be a little on the primitive side with this, because again, this, it's supposed to echo a handwritten uh, manuscript. So. You know that mechanical perfection would kind of uh, stick out and not be you know, keeping with the theme. And if you look in the look uh, behind the vice stand, you'll see my dog and lab assistant Brogan, who will you know continually be making guest appearances throughout this video, since he's endlessly fascinated with anything I'm doing tool-wise. Alright, now this is the uh, design I've decided to go for under the base. I thought about just putting it on the basic wooden, you know, block, but that just seemed a little boring, so I decided to uh, pick a design. This happens to be the Norse uh, runic compass for the Nine Worlds. As you see here, I've just used a regular Sharpie, and I've just drawn the same symbol out on the top of the uh, wood slice. Now I'm going to go over this with red. I just want, because again, I wanted to uh, just have a little contrast since the dragon's all black with just those green eyes. And I didn't, I wanted something that was going to be higher contrast. I thought about doing it in electric blue, but that just seemed a little uh, not vivid enough. So I decided to go with red. And this, as you see here in this time lapse, I just, after I'd drawn it out, I just went over it with the with the red. And I kept this whole section just so it's like because it's just kind of neat to watch things being done in fast forward. I thought it was a little much to have y'all sit there and watch it, watch the whole uh, shebang. Plus, that would eat up all the video time because this took me about because I was trying to be careful with what I was doing. It took about twenty minutes for me to. Uh, trace this out because I was trying to be you know a little careful with it. I just wish I could do it that fast in in real time. That'd make doing some of these projects a lot easier. Then I just have to wait for paint to dry instead of you know be done in two minutes and just waiting for the paint to dry rather than spending 20 minutes and waiting for the paint to dry before moving on to the next section. All right, and there you see me putting on the putting the last touches on that final section. And 
sorry I didn't get the blocking right on this section of the video. All I'm doing here is I'm uh, just painting in the, the word Night Fury written in Norse runes right on the front of the uh, slice where I'd taken the bark off. Now, any purists out there, anybody that you know knows about Norse runes knows that they're red. Traditionally, they're, re they're red from right to left as opposed to English, you know, being left to right. But the way they'd... Keep, again, keeping in theme with the movie itself, everything was done left to right. So I figured, all right, I may as well mimic that here. Plus, it's a little easier to you know, understand for your average uh, modern-day person that doesn't read Norse runes, because uh, since English shares a lot of uh, letter shapes you know, with Norse, you get to... You can still kind of make out the same shapes, even if it's not exactly what uh, we're all used to in English, as you'll see here when I show it to the camera in just a couple of in just a minute. Uh, I realized after I did that, you know, after painting it all in red, I'm like, all right, well, that's not bad, but you know, the edges can can get a little sloppy when you're working with paint, and plus it's. It wasn't. It's just not quite as vivid there as it would be, you know, as it is on the top where you see because it's that red over black. So I decided. I just decided to go over the edges and outline all of the uh, runes with just that marker again, as you see here. All right. Now this is me. You know, it's on my uh, cutting board, for lack of a better term. Uh, now here I'm just marking out the size of the uh, marked out the size of the wood slice. You know, gave it a little extra room so that I can so that after I pour the mold after I pour the resin and the thing sets up, I'll have some room to uh, cut it down and shape and polish it without you know running into the wood. Now, I've, I've had problems in the past where I've cut it too short and I ended up having to, like, ooh, if I try to you know, grind that down any further, I'm going to run into the piece I've embedded. So I had to go back and make another mold and then you know, pour it right around the you know an already poured resin block. That's just annoying and it you know wastes the mold material. So I've done enough of them now that I've kind of got the idea of how much extra space I need around an embedded piece. And uh, one thing I have always, I've been, I've always been pretty good at, as you'll see here in a, a couple of minutes, is that when I start assembling the mold, you'll notice that I don't just attach it with one kind of tape or glue. Uh, I used two on this particular piece, and I just use some regular transparent scotch tape, and then I use some painters and there's some masking tape on the outside to reinforce it, give it a little better. Uh, better adhesion and make sure it, I wasn't going to have any leaks or anything. This has been a I've seen a lot of uh, other resin workers on YouTube that they'll uh, make a really big mold like they're doing a river table or you know, some other large piece and they're just securing it with uh, they're securing their mold sides with just hot glue or maybe super glue and Maybe it may be a little Tyvek tape, but they're you know, obviously they they missed a spot or something just plain went wrong because they end up uh, with a huge amount of resin that just finds a little finds a little hole in the side of the mold and just pours out and not wanting to make a mess and not wanting to waste the resin since that's the most probably the most expensive part of this project, at least in terms of materials, I've always been a little paranoid about making uh, making my mold forms, as you'll see here. It's like, you see, I've already done it. I've secured it again with the... It's already been scotch taped up, and you see me, I'm doing uh, the first layer of masking tape. And as it continues, you'll see that I that I do a second layer. And even beyond that, just to you know, just to try to make sure that it's not, so that I can try to eliminate as much chance of a mold breaking as possible. When I actually was pouring resin, 
with this particular piece, I just put the wood slice in the bottom of the mold with maybe a quarter to a half inch of resin. You know, not enough that it was going to cause the wood to float and get out of place because I wanted to keep it centered in the mold, but just enough so that it would uh, form a base. So that when I went back and poured the, the rest of the resin, it was going to be much less likely that it would find a gap in the bottom of the mold. All right, and here we've jumped ahead a couple of days. I've uh, poured the rest of the resin with the figurine in it, and now what you see here is I'm taking off the plexiglass and with the aid of my heat gun and a screwdriver. And I cannot, I can't recommend enough if you're starting to do some, if you're starting to do resin work and you're casting uh, molds like this, uh, a heat gun is really your best friend because it, as the plexiglass heats up, you can separate it from the resin much, much easier than trying to break it off little bits and pieces at a time. As you see, um, this part, it only took me about five minutes to just take this entire side off. When On my first couple of pieces before I bought a heat gun, it took me two hours just to break off every little piece of plexiglass from the outside of uh, the piece. Because I was being a little stubborn and, you know, wasn't sure how far I was going to take working with resin, so I didn't want to spend a whole lot of money on equipment or anything like that, and I didn't already own a heat gun at that point. Then eventually I found out, well, that thing's going to be worth its weight in gold. Okay, here you see the, this is the basic, and this is what it looks like fresh out of the mold. You can see there's uh, little points on the top where the resin had sunk. A couple of gaps on the sides. Now this is a, uh, this is a buffing wheel, or a buffer, that I have uh, altered one side of it to be able to put sanding discs on. And the, I designed this so that the rest, the piece rest, will come apart from the rest of the base so that I can change out the sanding discs a lot easier uh, than you would normally. So I don't have to, I'm not trying to fiddle with this in a, in a half, quarter inch worth of space. And this is the first time I was uh, using this uh, modified buffer. So it was kind of a test that way to see if, all right, well, let's see how well I did making a, a sanding disc mount. Turns out, not too bad. I just had, you know, one little engineering failure. I had to, you know, have to go, I'm still in the process of fixing that as I'm recording this video and audio. Uh, but it worked pretty well. I mean, I, I didn't end up burning out my wrist trying to hold a resin piece that I was trying to shape on a you know, completely rigged up uh, sander that I'd turned on its side. This was, I mean, with the sander, with the disc in this direction, it makes it much easier. That So I'd, all I have to do is just make sure that the resin piece just maintains contact with the sandpaper, which is easy enough, and that's why the rest, the piece rest is there. Right. Here you see me, you know, looking it over and saying, ooh, that's nice. Uh, what I had not done at this point was I knew that I wanted to try to round off a couple of the corners you know, the, uh, along the back side of the piece which you'll see later on as it gets finished so that's what I'm doing at this point I'm just you know taking down those sharp corners and trying to turn it so that it forms a real smooth curve uh, and that's what this first that's what this real course this is an 80 grit sandpaper all that's really doing is it's letting me shape the piece and you know, it's letting me cut down uh, take down in a nice smooth layer of uh, any place where there were uh, air bubbles or gaps in the resin and taking down the corners uh, the sharp corners left at the top of the piece where the resin itself had sunk as it uh, cured and compressed but it left little traces in the corners of the mold so I end up with these little sharp you know, points in the top corners of the piece. So I'm just taking this off with a real coarse sandpaper. And you see here, this is the basic shape that I'm that's going to stick with it for the rest of the project. There I'm indicating the uh, smoothed corners, which is on the back of the piece, and then the 
nice sharp corners, which are on the front. That's that, that took me uh, the longest time to try to figure out uh, which was the front and which was the back of the piece after I'd already scratched it all up. Um, then I realized, you fool, you're not, you, you didn't sand down the bottom, so just look for, you know, the front of the pieces where there's no bark. So that made it a little easier once I rem once I remembered, hey, I still have a clear view in one spot. These are things we, you, know, you learn as you play. All right, now as you'll see, there, there'll be times that I, that I and the piece step off camera and it's just nothing but the uh, remaining torque working off of the uh, buffer and the dog sitting there just you know looking around enjoying the world and what I'm doing when I'm walking off screen like this is I'm either grabbing sandpaper or I'm taking the piece over to uh, an outside sink and reservoir that I'm just using to rinse off the uh, resin dust and any of the residue from the sanding disc itself because as you move upward in grit you don't want to end up uh, because basically what you're doing is you're, you're polishing out the scratches each successive grit of sandpaper takes out the scratches from the previous grit and what you don't want to do is end up you know, sliding around a big old piece of grit you know, from your 80 grit sandpaper when you're down to a, a thousand grit because that's just going to scratch your piece up a lot more. So just make sure you, one of the pieces of advice I've got for anybody working with resin or looking to do it is if you're uh, working with a piece that you know you're going to have to polish out like this with a sander, just make sure you rinse it off real thoroughly between every time you change the sandpaper. I know it's a little annoying, uh, but really this, it will save you a lot more time doing this, doing this than it will to go back and you get to the end of the piece and you think, all right, I'm done. I'm ready to do that final polish and move on. And you discover, ooh, you just, you scratched the, scratched a lot of it out because you didn't clean off residue from uh, the lower grit sandpapers. And this section is just in fast forward. I went from in an 80 grit to 120 grit to a, a 250 grit to a 600 grit now I should probably have used some better intermediate grades but uh, I'm not uh, not prepared at this stage of what I'm doing to be to have an 80 grit 100 grit 110 grit 120 grit and work all of that up um, I find that sure you'll get a nice perfect finish that way but it takes a lot more time uh, polishing it up than I really want to spend and if I'm looking since I'm looking to uh, sell these anything that adds to my production time of course adds to my overhead costs and makes the pieces more expensive that's not exactly what I'm looking for there are ways you can get around uh, being really stair step with the pieces now see this is what the piece looks like I've taken it to a the final sandpaper I'd used here was a 1500 grit. Now I have the sandpaper to go from you know, to 2000 and then up to a 3000, but uh, partly as an experiment again and again not wanting to add to my uh, production time with this, what I'm doing is uh, just taking out the last couple of nicks there as you see and I'm going to pull out a micro abrasive uh, gel as you'll see here in a minute after I use my air hose I cl I'm cleaning off all of the uh, grit and the resin dust off of my workbench because the there's a buff there's still a buffing wheel on the other side from where the sanding disc is it's on the far side of the camera's view I'm gonna try using this this was my attempt I'm going to use the uh, buffer to try to take a bunch of the scratches out and then I'm going to use those sponges that you saw and I'm gonna put that that's how I'll put the final polish on now it turns out I don't know if I just haven't developed the right knack for uh, working with a buffing wheel or I'm not using the right resin I mean I'm, I'm still experimenting with changing different parts of that out but it turns out it using the buffing wheel uh, didn't take all the nicks and notches out of the 
and out of the piece that I'd wanted. So what I end up doing is after I run the buffer for a bit with that, again, with the uh, micro abrasive uh, compound that you see, that's just a, and that's just Meguiar's 105, easy enough, you can get it at any automotive store. Uh, really one of the, that's one of the easiest and so far uh, best results I've had working with various polishing compounds. And I've tried turtle wax and uh, various other uh, abrasive uh, cleaners and the like. But the 105 is just, it's the best. And I only have to use that one compound instead of, you know, use one compound, rinse it all off the piece, and then change the wheel and start off with uh, the next compound. It's just, the 105 is just... It's so awesome and so easy to use that uh, I pretty much swapped to using that for everything. All right, and as you'll see here in just a minute, I'm gonna uh, take it off the, you know, step away from the buffing wheel, look at it, and I knew by this point that it was really not working out. You know, I wasn't I wasn't buffing any of the pieces out. I was basically just. Uh, in some cases, I actually marred up the piece a little bit, so didn't want to do that too bad. It, I mean, any of those mars, I, I knew I was going to be able to get out with the uh, buffing and polishing foam pads on the other side, and as you'll see here in just a minute. And I'll bring it, you'll see me bring the piece over to the camera, and I'll show you where there's still some nicks and uh, the overbuffed marks. But again, I'm a little stubborn and I'm always trying to add to my techniques because there's you know, there's things you can accomplish with a buffing wheel you can't with a polishing pad and, and all the rest. So I'll probably keep working that off and on. All right, see, as you see here, it's still pretty cloudy. There's still some nicks and uh, notches cut out of it because, like I said, this was a prototype of the sanding wheel, so the sanding mount, rather, so... I ended up with some uh, nasty little scratches that I know if I tried to get them out with with the sanding pad with the sanding disc I was still gonna end up with the same problem and it wasn't really gonna make anything better so ultimately what I decided to do was to uh, take the piece in and after I cleaned it off and then I uh, set it and I actually poured a tabletop resin over the top of this it's a you know the real thin uh, resin gives you a mirror finish but you don't have to the excess will come off. And here you see I'm trying to, uh, I try, uh, again, this is just an illustration. I was trying to get some of those nicks and uh, dings out of it with the Meguiar's and the foam pad. I mean, it did pretty well, but there were still some uh, deep enough and nasty enough nicks that I knew the only way I was going to get them out, and it was to uh, rework the uh, sanding mount and then uh, run through a complete uh, sanding cycle again. But I didn't want to, I wanted to get this video out. So I decided, all right, yeah, I'll just take it in and I'll put that tabletop resin on it and then move along. Cause I knew that was, you know, it was just gonna be an overnight setup and I was gonna end up with just having one side to uh, sand down in just the bottom, the way I had it set up. Yeah. As you see, I just, yeah. This is just going to be the same every time with your, if you're working with this, you just use a nut, because this is a, technically the, the Meguiar's 105 is a cutting compound. So you use a real stiff uh, foam pad, which is what I've got here. That's what the orange uh, pad is. They're color coded. And as you see, it kind of, I didn't have a firm enough grip on it and it kicked it right out of my hand and ended up marring the piece again as it hit the uh, concrete. And here I've added some more 105 to it and trying to polish it up, polish it up, hoping against hope that I was going to be able to get some of those uh, nicks and gouges out of it. And that's where I realized what one of the engineering problems with my sanding mount was and 
realized again I was not going to be able to fix that in time to finish the piece and get this video out in a timely fashion. So this is what it looks like after I've run it with the 105 and the other piece. Now this is the final uh, coat on the piece. You can still see on the bottom of this there's still some of the tabletop resin is has not been sanded off on the bottom but I was trying the lighting was so perfect I wanted to get some and good shots of it. Now if you look on his on the figure's lap uh, right back leg and on his uh, hind end there was a that's a rather large bubble. Yeah and aside from that bubble uh, this is uh, I'm still pretty happy with the piece. I mean I, I wish it had been a little clearer but eh, these are the things we learn. All right, now, if you're interested in acquiring this piece or uh, find, getting a custom one done, you can follow the links in the description, and you'll find uh, links to all my art and my personal website. And once again, this is Jason with Green Star Productions. I'd like to thank you for giving me a little of your time. And if you like this video, again, please hit that thumbs up button and subscribe if you want to see more of my content.